hopefully. Yeah. So first yeah, off, you know, what is 11 to You want to start uh, yeah. off so by saying that? How many people know what a static site generator is? Okay. Most people. Um, it's basically just a small utility that transforms templates into HTML. That's all it does at its core. Um, maybe the most famous static site generator is Jekyll. Um, that was written in Ruby. It's been around for a really long time. If you've ever used GitHub pages, you probably use Jekyll because they they run Jekyll automatically when you publish something in GitHub pages unless you opt out of it. Um, so, yeah, I started writing 11D about uh, a little over two years ago um, because I wanted something similar to Jekyll but in Node. Um, and over the last two years, it's kind of taken off and gotten a little crazy. Um, there's a bunch of really high profile sites uh, that are using it. Um, it's being used at CSS Tricks. It was used at CERN. Um, ESLint uses it for their website. Uh, FFConf, Khan Academy has used it for a thing. Netlify uses it. Uh, if you've been to the Google V8 website, that's running on 11 d um, and then Google's web.dev educational site is also running on 11 d right now, which is just like, I don't know, it blows my mind that that is a thing. Um, NickNeesy.com. <laughs> NickNeesy.com <laughs> also runs on it. Uh, my website runs on it, and then all of these fine people here have built things with it. Uh, if you use it and built something with it, you can add your profile to our, or add your image to our uh, homepage as well. Uh, it's just a one short like code change away. So yeah, so uh, just today I thought it would be good to just go through building a project with 11D from scratch just to kind of show you how it works, um, why people are kind of excited about it, why I like it, and why I think it is really a great tool to build um, a very fast website easily. Um, so, yeah, this is the documentation. I think what we should probably do is just uh, start in terminal right now. Does anybody have any questions about what I've said so far? No. All right, let's just build a project. Um, really, the thing that most people are using it for now is to build their personal sites. Um, and it's just a real easy way to get a, a blog up and running with RSS and a lot of the syntax highlighting features and things that you might expect, expect on a blog. And so I think Nick has created a empty directory. That's right. Through. All right. Called um, blog. All right. Yeah, blog. Nothing in it. Uh, let's try installing 11D. If you want to do the quick start, we can do it. We can start there. If you go back to the documentation, there's like a go back to the home page. Yeah. There's just a quick start right there. All right at the top. Oh. Yeah, scroll up. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you have it installed already, but let's just install it globally because that's kind of the easiest way to just like get started with it. Uh, and this will actually use npm to install 11D on your local machine. Um, it will create a basically a, a, an executable on your path that you can run. Um, and so you can run 11D in any directory. And once this installs, super fast, npm install, then we'll create a template. All right, great. Okay. Um, and then we'll run it. So what Nick did there was he made a markdown, like a very simple markdown page that just has a, a h1 header, so the page header, and he made a readme.markdown file. Um, that's all that's in it. So what we'll do is just run 11 on the command line. Yep. Right here. Oh, yeah, you already did it. What's the deal with this like split screen? Oh, sorry. That was... Oh, that's fine. I was just wondering why you did it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, all right, so what 11 does is it looks for valid templates inside of the folder, and then it will process those to uh, whatever output that you've specified. So we have this readme.markdown file, and what we what 11 does here is it makes an underscore site directory by default. You can customize that to whatever you want. And then it makes a readme folder with an index.html file in it. 
Uh, the reason 11D makes these folders with index.html files in them by default is so that we can get clean URLs in our output without having to do any server configuration. So we can link to readme slash without having to include this index.html. And a lot of web, most web servers will treat that as the default file um, for a directory access. So when you link to just like the readme directory, this index file will show up. And so you can see inside of this output file, the index.html, uh, we processed the markdown into HTML. So we had just a, that pound page header. And in markdown, that means it's a, an H1. And so we've transformed that to be uh, an H1 in the output. And the easiest way maybe to uh, test that this is all working correctly is 11D also includes a hot, hot reloading uh, local web server. If you run 11 e dash dash serve, and it will show you what URLs uh, or what what you have to type in the browser to actually get to the page. And the confusing part about what we built so far is that there's nothing at the root because there's only a README file there. So you would have to type in README uh, in your URL to make it work. Yep, there you go. So. Congratulations, we built something that we didn't have to build. Woo! Um, so yeah, this is like that's like the simplest thing you can do. It transforms something into something else. Uh, the neat part about 11 e that is different from a lot of other static site generators is that it's not coupled to a specific templating language. Um, so Jekyll was tied to using liquid templates uh, with Gatsby. You have to use React. Um, so a lot of them are tied sort of one to one. I know there's a, another popular one in um, Go called QGo that has its own special proprietary templating language that's tied to it. Um, but 11 is sort of tries to be as decoupled as possible. Um, I'm working on making it more easily decoupled in the future. But we do bundle, I think, like 11 templating languages built in. Um, which I did not realize until someone pointed that out to me, which is kind of funny if it would be 11, but that was not intentional, but it turned out that way. Anyway, so uh, when you're doing a markdown file, you actually have access to um, templating language liquid by default. Um, so 11D by default, because it's sort of based in, in Jekyll, um, has Jekyll roots. We try to, in the beginning at least, get as many people to move into Jekyll as possible. And so we made, and when I say we, I don't know why I'm saying we, I, I made the default um, templating language associated with markdown files to be liquid. So inside of liquid, let's go back to our readme markdown file. How many people are familiar with liquid? Oh, okay. um, we can go through it a little bit. So if we open up our readme.md file, um, you can actually use um, a liquid syntax inside of here. So a lot of things, uh, like common convention with static site generators is they include <clears throat> data. And so you want to process data to output your templates. And an easy way you can do that is using something called front matter. Front matter is just like a convention that someone has invented over the years and it's become very common. Um, it's basically just three dashes and then another three dashes on a new line, and anything in between those two lines, uh, it, by default, use the YAML format, which is basically like a key, a colon, and then a value. So let's just type title, colon, um, Nick's cool blog. And so what this does is this makes an actual like data value that we can use inside of our template. So let's change our page header to be uh, curly curly and then title and so this is liquid syntax this tells liquid hey i'm using a, the title variable here and i want to output it um, so if we go back if you save that and then you go back to um, the web server that we were, we were already running uh, it will update or it hasn't updated yet but you have to have a an H valid html body tag for the hot reloading to work we haven't put that in yet but um, if you reload the page, you'll see the update. And that's, so we processed, we've now processed a liquid template in 11D. 
um, and we're using data to transform our our page. Um, are there any questions about that so far? No. All right. Cool. Um, so the next thing we can do is we'll let's make just uh, another another markdown file. Okay. And let's show how we can use those together. What should I call it? Uh, you should rename README because that's not really like let's let's make a blog man. Let's do like a Nick's awesome post one. Okay. So should I make a sites directory first or a post directory or? You can if you want to. Do you want to do that, Nick? I don't know. You tell me. What's the best way? Uh, yeah. Eleven doesn't let's care, right? A, yeah. So Eleven tries to be as ag agnostic to directory structure as possible. So it will really try and work with how you want to use it. Okay. Um, let's do a yeah. Let's do a post directory since you said that. Um, and let's put like post one inside of there. And then let's copy that that contents from the README into that file. Um, and then let's let's call it cool blog post or something so it's different. And then uh, let's make another post file like post O2 I guess you could do. Um, and I guess you can see down at the bottom that every time you save, Eleven is running uh, over and over again. Um, so let's make another title here, I guess, um, with maybe like yet another blog post, super engaging content. All right, and then let's go back and, and try and find these in our server to make sure that they're processing correctly. So we let's yeah posts and then post dash o one. And then that worked, and so post dash o two. Hooray! One of those is not a oops, an h one, but that's fine. We don't need that. All right, so we have our two blog posts. Let's make an index page that loops over those, so we can make like a, a home page that will have links to all of our blog posts. Okay. Should this be a markdown file as well? Yeah. Let's do that. Why not? All right. All right, so the way that you combine uh, or sort of create relationships between different templates in Eleventy is something called collections. And the only thing you need to do to put uh, a piece of content into a collection is to um, assign a tag to it. So inside of our post 01.md, we'll have a tags, add tags to the front matter, and then let's just say posts. Is that? Oh uh, yeah, you can do that. Uh, it's probably easier if you just make it a string. Okay. Let me all work with that too. Like this. Post to not plural. Yep. Okay. And then make, put that. Add that to the other post as well. And when you're using YAML, you, you can use strings. You, I mean, you can use quotes, or you you can not use quotes. It's kind of up to you. It doesn't really matter. Um, all right. And let's go back to our index. MD, remember that one. Okay. All right. And then um, let's actually go to the 11D documentation so we can look at collections. I think there's a nice, easy uh, example on there. I got the super huge button. So my, like my, my boss told me they couldn't find the documentation button. So I was like, all right, I'll make it bigger. <laughs> And actually expand. So if you have an ultra wide monitor, it will like it's just huge. It's amazing. Anyway, um, so yeah, this is the documentation on collections. Um, you can kind of see we, it has the same thing that we just did there. It has a post tag, and then here, right at the bottom, there's an example of looping over uh, something in a collection. So let's, I guess, uh, just copy that four four line. Since we're using Markdown. Okay. All right. And then um, in Markdown to make a list, yeah, you need that too. So in Markdown to, to make a list, you would just do um, 
think it's space dash either dash space dash or space um, asterisk. I think also works. Yep. Um, and then you'll want to output um, curly curly post dot data dot title, and that will uh, use the front matter data in each of our templates. Uh, make a list of those. So let's see what this brought up. All right, so we've now associated our root template with our two child or posts that we're, we've written. And now what we need to do is make them links. So let's go back to our markdown. And to make a link in markdown, it's kind of awkward, but you, it's like two square brackets. And then the URL goes into um, parentheses. So the square brackets holds the text. Yep. So um, actually. Yeah. Yep, there you go. And then inside of that, we want to output our URL, which is post.url. All right, perfect. All right, so now we've made. Oh, I see what's happening. Yeah, All right, so because of these dashes, do, right? Yeah, we need to get rid of those dashes. So what? So this is kind of like an advanced thing that you probably like. Or it's going to overload you, but um, when you have dashes in Liquid, it, it controls the white space before the tags and after the tags. So if you put dash percent and a curly, it will actually remove all the white space between the curly and the next character. Um, so it allows you to sort of format your source a little bit nicer. Um, but yeah, it's just, it just sort of ruined our mark down here. So, um, what happened? Can you view store? Oh, I see what happened. Okay, go back. It's not parsing them as lists because it's uh, the white space is wrong. The markdown is super. Uh. I think you have too much white space at the start of the line. I've used this tool before. <laughs> yeah, so now we have like live links to our actual pieces of content. Um, and Elevity has plugins to do like RSS. So if you want to make an RSS feed for that, we can we can do that. Um, that's uh, yeah. I don't know how interesting that would be. Um, but what we should do next, I think, is we'll make a layout. Um, so a layout is um, basically a wrapper for your template. So if you view source on this page, Nick, you'll see that um, it's not valid HTML because there's no uh, there's no HTML element, um, there's no title element. Those are actually the only two things that are required by HTML. But um, we'll ideally want like a body and a doc type as well, um, so we can make our HTML not shitty. Um, so let's go ahead and make a layout to do that. So in Eleven D, by default. Uh, Eleventy has this idea of an includes folder, so let's make a underscore includes folder. And all of these folder names are configurable um, in your configuration file, um, which we haven't gone over yet. But um, if you're not tied to like this weird name structure, you can um, customize that to be whatever you want. And so inside of this includes folder, let's just make a new layout file. And one of the neat things about Eleventy, uh, it supports a bunch of different templating languages, and your templating language doesn't have to be the same as the template that is consuming it. So let's make a nunjux layout, for example. Let's try that out. Um, yeah, you can name it whatever you want. Base um, and so now we have to, now we have our oh nice. Um, now we have our um, HTML that we want to use. Uh, and we need to tell Eleven D where to put the content that we want to that, that we want the layout to wrap. Um, so inside of this file, we we need to tell it to output the content variable because Eleven D has a special uh, content variable that it uses for layouts to set content. So yes, in Nunjux, it's still just curly curly to output a variable. Um, but Nunjex is a little bit more complicated in that it will auto escape all your HTML, so you need to um, do a pipe and then save. And that just tells Nunjex not to 
um, double escape the stuff in this variable. So if you um, if you are outputting HTML in Nudgex, you need to use this safe filter. It's actually a public filter, um, but we can go over that later. All right, so now we need to tell our uh, our template to use this layout. So let's go to our index.html or index.markdown, sorry. And in our front matter, let's add some front matter here. Uh, we just say layout colon uh, base.mjk. Save that. And go back. So there's our source. Yeah, so. What Eleven you did there, yeah, go back to view source, is that it took the content and injected it into the layout. Um, and the neat thing about layouts that is maybe not the most intuitive thing from the outset is that you can use variables inside of your layout that are set in your uh, markdown file. So we have this index.markdown. I could set variables in my front matter and use those in my layout however I want um, because the sort of the data aggregation that happens in 11D is separate from the rendering. Um, we gather all the data before we do any rendering, um, which isn't super obvious to people, but I think it's super powerful because you can sort of do whatever you want in your layouts um, and control those in your templates, which is kind of nice. Um, so yeah, now you can kind of see also that I injected the script. This is only uh, for the dash dash serve. It isn't included with, um, the sort of normal build of 11D, that's just the hot reloading stuff. Um, by default, 11D has no um, client side JavaScript associated with it. It's just a build tool, um, which is actually a huge strength and a huge selling point that we've seen uh, for people that have sort of dived into more deeper, more tighter integrated, like front end framework tools. Um, so, for example, uh, like Views static site generator has a bunch of client side JavaScript that runs with it. And not all sites need a ton of like client side JavaScript, right? Like uh, you might not need a huge JavaScript framework for your blog, for example. And so it's it's really nice to have an alternative that doesn't include any of that hefty JavaScript if you want to make a site and control sort of all of the output that comes from it, uh, make a nice streamlined small site. Um, so yeah, we made a layout. Let's uh, also apply that layout to our blog posts. Okay. Let's add some uh, HTML to our, or add some content to our layout to show how that shows up too. Okay. Maybe just like a footer or something. Copyright, Nick Nisi. 2019, just kidding. 2020. Still started typing it? Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, so that will sort of tell us that the layout has applied visually, because otherwise we couldn't really tell. So let's click, click through to one of these and see if that applied. All right, cool blog post. So now our layout is applying to all of our templates. So another powerful feature of 11D is that it will do, it will allow you to apply data to more than one template at a time. So we have something called data directory files. So let's go back to our posts folder and let's make a new file in there called um, posts.json. And inside of that, we can add whatever data we want to apply to all of our posts. So for example, here, well, let's use it to apply to our layout, to our layout to all of our posts at the same time. Um, and base.mjk. Um, then quit out of this and delete that from the front matter there so we can see that it's actually being used. Okay, it's deleted out both both of those. Okay, yeah, let's go back and reload it. And so what 11D does there is that we have an idea of a data cascade. So go back to the directory structure so we can see what's actually happening. 
So you can see this posts folder. Anytime you have a folder on 11D, it will look for a JSON file inside of that folder that has the same folder name. So posts look, looks for posts.json. Um, and if it finds a, a file in the directory with that file name, it will apply all of the data into each template's data when it renders. So you can see we use that to apply layout to both post one and post two. If you had a post three, it would automatically apply to that. Any file that you add to this folder will now include this layout. So it's kind of like a way, nice, easy way to set data for anything inside of the folder. Um, and that sort of works in a hierarchical way. So if you have nested folders, you can have any number of uh, of these data directory directory data files that you want, and the cat table sort of apply um, or downstream, which is I guess kind of confusing. But if you had another subfolder inside of posts called subdir, and you made a subdir.json, it would only apply to that stuff. Subdir.json would only apply to the stuff inside of that folder, and post would apply to everything, including the things in the subdirectory. That makes sense. Uh, are there any questions on any of that so far? So if you needed a script to run the header, just on like one page, yeah, you can't put that in the main base uh, template. Where would you put that in the front section? Somehow? Yeah, you can do that. You can put it in the main template, um, uh, and then you can use sort of just a statement, like right? A yeah, you can use additional to you know, turn that on and off. Um, another thing that you can do. Um, is in some of my projects, um, you can sort of create an object structure that controls like what script tags get inserted where in your template. You can sort of consume that. So that might be a little nicer way to do it. Um, so that way you're not like hard coding things into your, into your um, layout. You might be hard coding them into your template, but that's fine. Um, that answer your question? Yep. Any other questions? Do all the values override each other? So if I change my layout in a subfolder, that would just override it. Yeah, good question. So yes, it, there's a there's a a definition of how the overrides take place. And let's go to the documentation so I can show, show the page about the data cascade. Yeah, right there. So there's a bunch of different places that we consume data from. And so the top number one there in that, in that list takes priority. And number five at the bottom is the least priority. Um, and so front matter always overrides anything further down the chain. Um, so you can see data directory files and directory data files. Um, number four is kind of the one of the lowest and then global data files. Um, is the is the lowest of the low, and we can go we can go into global data files I guess real just real quick. It's just a underscore data folder. Maybe click that. Yeah, number five there. Um, this is just a a, a a folder full of JS or JSON files that you want to apply to all your templates. So. Directory data files are a way to sort of scope your data to specific templates. If you want specific data to be available everywhere, you would add it to this global data folder. Um, and by default, that's underscore data. But you can change that to whatever you want to. I find myself using this less and less, but um, it is a nice way just to have some global data available. Um, let's see. Let's kind of go over here. So we did layouts, we did collections. Oh, layout chaining. So inside of a layout template, you can actually specify another layout. You can have its own front matter as well. So if you want to chain layouts together, you can do that, and it won't nest however you want it to nest. Um, and layout front matter is also part of the data's cascade as well. So it's in that list. Um, let's go through. Pagination next because I think that's like a no, let's do permalinks next. So by default, Eleveny has this 
uh, convention of where it where it expects the uh, the output to go. So it consumes templates from the input and it uh, automatically outputs them based on um, the rules that 11 has determined. So we talked about that readme folder with the index.html file in it. If you want to change that convention, you can do that using uh, what we call permalink. Um, so if you scroll down a little bit, you can actually remap the, the output to whatever you want. Um, so you just add this permalink key in your front matter, uh, and then you can basically put whatever you want there. Um, and if the directories don't exist, well, it will create them for you automatically. Um, and I don't think you even need that index.html there. You can just leave it as a trailing slash and it will work fine. Um, yes, yeah, so we can demo that. Up. Oh, you're going to test me. All right. Uh, yeah, so you can see down at the bottom it says writing set underscore site. This is a new path subdirectory testing. Um, and this is a really nice way to sort of decouple the file name from where you want it to live, or even the directory that it lives in from where you want it to output. Um, so those things don't need to necessarily be tied together. Um, and you can decouple those if you want, but I end up using defaults quite a bit for new projects. Um, this is maybe more useful if you're um, sort of upgrading an old project and you want to maintain um, the same URLs in, in, in 11G that you did in maybe your previous project's uh, generator. Um, yeah, so let's go back to the... Let's go back here. All right. Let's look at um, pagination. So pagination, uh, when, when people first hear about pagination, they think, okay, like a normal Google search result, right? And you want to report over like infinite scroll or whatever, you would go page one, page two, page three, page four. Like I, I have 400 results and I want to create um, 40 pages that show 10 results each. Um, and so if you want to do something like that, use pagination. Um, and so a lot of people use this to uh, not have all of their blog posts shown on a single page, for example, on their blog index page. Um, and that's useful. Another thing you can do with pagination is consume data from a CMS. So if you're using 11D with WordPress headless, for example, and you make a request to WordPress headless um, to fetch blog posts um, from that or another CMS, a lot of times they'll come back and one big giant JSON request, um, or maybe you have a data export from a, uh, from a service that you're consuming. Um, pagination will actually allow you to iterate over a data set and create multiple output files from a single input file, so from a single input template. Um, and maybe we can go over an example of that real quick um, to make it more obvious. Um, sort of the easiest thing you can do, and this is sort of the example that I talked about originally with Google search results, is that it will iterate over an array of data. So in YAML, you know, when you have test data, this is just an array in YAML. You have the syntax is just dashes, um, which I guess is very confusing if you, since I just taught you that that's what Markdown does for lists. Um, but again, this like inside of the front matter. Uh, is is a is a YAML syntax there, which is um, it is what it is. <laughs> it's very popular. I'm not a huge fan of it, but um, you can use whatever front matter format you want. Um, but again, 11 d just uses this one as a default. But it is extensible, so you can change this. Um, let's see. Let's actually like. I don't know. Today we went through an example, earlier today I went through an example with like the Rick and Morty API to create um, a bunch of characters from the Rick and Morty API. Maybe that's like a good, we could just do that real quick to show how you can use pagination to divide up a, uh, an API call. And that would be a good introduction to data files too as well. And maybe it'll be a good example we can go. So let's look up the, I had never heard of this before today and I, I'm sorry if you hate Rick and Morty, but 
Again, this is just is what it is. This, I'm assuming? <laughs> I guess. Um, so go to the documentation. Uh, get multiple characters. Get all characters. Let's do that one. All right. Can you just copy and paste that URL into the into the um, address bar so we can make sure that it returns that correctly? Okay. Cool. All right. So we can do this a couple of different ways. Um, if we add a global data file, we can make these characters available to all of our pages. If we add a data directory file, we can make it available to just our posts. Let's make a global data file just because that might be a good way to talk about global data. Okay. So let's make our underscore data folder. Okay. And then inside that, we'll make a, I guess, rickandmorty.js. All right, so open that up. And this is just like a, your standard Node JavaScript file. You can do whatever you can do in Node inside of this file. Um, and if Eleven-E will sort of work with that. Um, so inside of Node, to do a normal node module, you use something called module.exports. And then whatever you return, or whatever you assign to module.exports is um, what 11D will use as in this data file. So you, Nick has done a function here. You don't have to do a function either. You could just do like a string or an object or like if you already have, yeah, maybe we'll just do this real quick. Okay. Um, so now we've created a Rick and Morty.js, which has this hello string inside of it. And let's consume that on our index page. Go back to the index template. And let's just output, um, which is curly curly, Rick and Morty. So the file name controls what the variable name is uh, in 11D. So we named our file Rick and Morty.js. And that's what 11D. Uh, uses Rick and Morty.js. We use Rick and Morty uh, as the variable for all the, the data that's returned here. And so Eleventy basically works with uh, almost anything you can send, uh, you can return inside of that of Rick and Morty.js file. So let's go back there. Uh, yeah, let's make a new function. Yeah, before. And inside of that, let's just return hello again or make a difference so we know it changed. All right, so it can be a function, it can be uh, an asynchronous function, um, it can be a promise, it can be, there's like a whole bunch of different things and you all want to list on the documentation. Um, so it really gives you a lot of flexibility if you want to make like API, API calls. So for example, if you want to make a dynamic call to this Rick and Morty API, we can just make it an async function. Uh, then we'll need to get node fetch to, um, to actually make that request. Mm -hmm. Is that something I have to install, I assume? Yeah, yeah. Is it node, node fetch? Dash fetch? Node fetch is just a module to make, make network requests. Uh, Just it. Oh, oh. I don't think you have a package JSON yet. So oh. I don't know where that's going to go. Node modules directory. Hopefully. All right, and let's look at the docs for that because I, I don't remember how it works. Sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I don't, I'm not going to memorize this documentation. Um, there should be just like a simple like fetch. There you go. Okay. Let's get one. Just copy and paste that one. Uh, put that inside here. And let's update that URL to be our Rick and Morty URL. Cover that one. Did I make a request? 
I do. You do? Oops. I never really got into it. I've always been like worried that it would copy my passwords. It does. Like password or something to use the clipboard. Anyway, um, so what this will do is make a network request, uh, convert it to JSON from like the text that it receives over the network. And then we'll probably want to delete that last line. So I don't think we can make a console log with that. And so this returns what looks like a promise, and so let me go work with that just by default. Um, all right, yeah, let's just use this. Uh, we miss a, not me, like auto formatted. Okay. Um, so let's go back to our index.md. Uh, it looks like there's an error. Can't find modules, no fetch. Oh, maybe. Oh, yeah, maybe. There we go. Yeah. Hooray. All right, so, so what happened there is it got the JSON from the um, from the network, from the API, and we just basically output it to the screen because it's, it's everything in that JSON gets assigned to that Rick and Morty variable. Nick's going to do some awesome refactoring here. So now we have the JSON to work with. Right, yeah, let's return. Okay, yeah, that's good. I like that. Return JSON dot. No idea. Let's go back and try and parse this weird. Yeah, you have to go back to the browser to see. Oh, sorry. A better way to, I think if you open this in Firefox, it will actually land. No, it's not like a JSON content type, so it yep. okay. Um, That's okay. Can parse that? Oh, there's results. Results. Here. Okay, there we go. Sweet. Documentation is valuable. Hey, check that out. All right, so let's go back and just return that dot results or whatever. Okay. JSON dot results. Um, and this is all just JavaScript. There's no like 11D specific stuff in this data file. Um, uh, 11D has some nice like benchmarking stuff built in here to tell you like what, what like if, if a certain part of your 11D build is taking a lot of time, you can see that our Rick and Morty.js took up 94% of our build time because it's making a network request and those are expensive. Um, but it actually made, got some data, so let's go back in. Um, all right, yeah, we got the data. That's fine. Let's iterate over it and make uh, make uh, character pages for all of these different characters. So let's do that with the pagination template. So let's make a separate template. Okay. Characters dot. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, you don't want that in your includes. You want that somewhere else. Oh, oops. Uh, where do I want it? Let's just put it in the root. All right, so let's add a front matter to this. Dash, 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 and then let's do pagination. As tells 11 you to enable the pagination in the colon. And then we have to tell it what data to consume. I don't know if you can do, I think you have to do two spaces, right? Uh, go to a new line, yeah. two spaces, and then data, colon, uh, Rick and Morty. All right, and then we need to tell it. Uh, so pagination, again, is about taking our single input file, which is this, characters at njk and creating a bunch of output files from it. So we need to tell it how many, uh, how to divide up our data. And so uh, there's the, this option of, there's this notion of a size and it controls how big your chunk of data is for a single template. So 
There is no default for this. You have to set it yourself. So we need to say size colon one to tell that we want a single, we want an output file for every single uh, iteration. All right, and now let's see. Let's make an alias too to make it easier to work with. Um, this just basically lets us assign a variable to the current chunk of data that we're operating on. Yeah. Um, and we'll just name that character. And let's use that in our template. What's the data that comes back in that result that we got? So we have name, status, species. Name and an image. Let's use those two. Okay. All right, so let's do character.name, uh, output, sorry, curly, curly, character.name, and then uh, let's make an image. Yep, image source, character.image. And if you're really building this, you definitely want to include an all attribute uh, for accessibility. All right, so let's go back to our output and see what happened, like our console output. All right, so what happened was, is that we've iterated over this results array that we got back from the service, and it created a single page for every single character we got back from the service. Um, so if you are consuming, again, if you were consuming WordPress CMS, uh, like a CMS or WordPress headless, like something like that, you can create an individual blog post template for every single entry in the, in the API call that comes back very easily. Um, and we can, again, we can control uh, where the output goes with the permalink. So let's do that real quick. Uh, let's go back to our, yep, our characters. And then, uh, yep, there you go. Uh, permalink, and then let's say characters. Would it be like that? Uh, doesn't matter. Characters slash, uh, and then let's, in, inside of permalink, it's a little bit fancy because you can actually output um, template syntax there too. So we can use character dot name there. Um, the awkward part here is that a lot of the names will have spaces in them. Um, so what Eleveny does, that has a filter. So to use a filter, we use that bar, and then we'll just say slug. And that will convert a string into basically a small lowercase with dashes in between them. And so yeah, now we're getting closer to what we might want. We can see each of these uh, individual files were created. Unfortunately, it looks like we didn't have a trailing slash on the permalink. So it made files and not folders, which is going to be awkward. We might need to blow away the output directory. That's fine. Yep, we're going to need to blow it away because it's trying to overwrite. This happened earlier today. Yeah. Um, it's trying to overwrite the files with folders. All right, cool. So now we have a, a, a single character page for every single en entry in that array that came back from our service. Um, and we can do like a very similar thing with collections. Pagination and collections work together. So you can actually add tags to this pagination template. Uh, and you can say like characters. And then you could iterate over that uh, inside of another template if you wanted to output a list to all of these character templates as well. So the minus the pagination um, front matter, this front matter is applied to every page? Right, yeah. Um, okay. Is there any questions on that part? I know that might have been left with a ton of stuff. So what does tag do here? Tags adds the template into a collection. So before we were using collection for posts, so we could have a list of all of our blog posts that we created. Now we're, we have a different collection set up for all of our characters. So we can iterate over our characters to show uh, links to all of our character templates that we've created. Um, and so the the syntax for this is going to be a little different because it's a 
Well, no, that's right. Uh, data. I don't think I don't think we have a title on the pagination template. You're right. Um, you can add one. Or we should add a name. Is permalink handled specially, or could you use front matter and other tags? Permalink is only applied to, or sorry, templating languages are only rendered inside of permalink. Okay. It's just like a special thing. The permalink tag, Rick, Rick, in the tag, so uh, if I like compare it to name, compare it to name. You couldn't tag Rick in the tags. Sorry, you couldn't use like uh, character about name. I can do something like. Yeah, no, go back, go to our other template. Yeah, that, that would work. Go back to the other template. Uh, use data.character.name. Character? Yeah, this is going to be confusing. Data.character. Yeah. Okay. Because the data holds, holds the entire data cascade for the template inside of that key. Um, So that's okay. That's one. Okay, so th this is going to be again another thing you have to know, which is kind of hard, but this is like a backwards compatibility thing that Levity has. So, um, by default, when you're using pagination and collections together, it will only assign the first page of the uh, pagination to a collection. And the reasoning behind that was if you're using numeric pag pagination, so for example, Google results style, where you just have numeric pages, you probably might want the root template to show up in a collection. If you want all of the um, objects inside of a pagination, all the templates inside of a pagination template to apply in a collection, there's an option you have to enable, and I forget what it is. Let's go to the, let's go back to the documentation. It's, uh, let's see, collections, and it's, it might be on pagination. Oh, we're on pagination. Okay. Uh, uh, add all pagination pages to collections. It's like at the bottom. All right. Add all pages to collections. True. That's what you need to add to your front matter. Scroll down. Let me see. Oh, here. Yeah, right there. Okay. So I add that to the characters. characters yep. Inside of pagination. Okay. And that will likely change as the, the default for that will likely change in the next major version, so it won't be so confusing. Because I feel like the numeric pagination stuff is not as common as maybe this use case. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, so now we have uh, a page for every single um, character in Rick and Morty. Which is that all of them? Yeah, I think it's. I think the request is paginated too. Oh. Okay. <laughs> For the API extension. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you wanted to aggregate those together, you could, you could do that inside the JavaScript file, but you'd have to sort of aggregate all those different promises together for all those different requests. And I don't think we're going to do that right now because that would not be fun. Um, as if this wasn't fun, I would rather have so much fun right now. Is there any other questions about like pagination, collections, like how you build templates? Um, oh, that's a good question. Let's go back to the documentation. On the bottom, um, there's basically the template languages section, and you can do um, it's just a big part of a list of them at the top. So there's HTML, which is just like plain text basically, um, Markdown, which we already showed, 11e.js, which is um, just JavaScript, so similar to what you would do in the, and any JavaScript is supported in our JavaScript data file, you can have JavaScript just be a template as well. So if I were to create an 11d.js template file, I can just return a string and that will be what will be used in the output. Um, and that's really kind of nice because you can use a lot of like newer frameworks um, to work with that. I know some people are using like lit HTML, doing fancy things with web components. Um, because again, those are just not no no JavaScript no JavaScript files, um, and you can do whatever you want inside of those. Uh, works asynchronously, 
yeah, template literal directory, really nice um, syntax. I really like those. And so um, the added benefit of doing using JavaScript templates is that there is a backup. So there's not any extra like parsing and um, interpolation that needs to happen inside of a template template language module. It's just the like the VA is doing it all for you. Um, Liquid, as I mentioned, is the same one that Jekyll Jekyll uses. Nunjex is a really popular one that was created at Mozilla. Uh, Handlebars, I think, is like a, an Ember one, maybe? Um, invented by the guys that made Ember. Is Mustache Handlebars or just Handlebars? What, what is, is that? It's Mustache. And so that's the old school one. And then they yeah. extend it to H or Handlebars. Yep. So then Ember uses the HTML bars. Oh, they have a new one. HTML bar? I'm pretty sure. Okay. I've never heard of that one. 12 and D coming soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the thing that people are really sort of beat my door down about is uh, adding more extensibility to the template language hooks that we have to allow plugins to add whatever template language they want. Um, and that will be coming in the, in at least, I don't know, one or two more versions probably. I have all the code written, but I'm not really super happy with it. I wanted to make it more, uh, more extensible. I want it to work with. Um, basically, my dream is that I want this. I want you to be able to process any kind of file um, with the levity. So, I want to use this to um, process SVG files, for example, and apply optimizations to my SVG files that come through the levity's pipeline. Uh, I want to use this to optimize PNG, uh, other images. Make do my image optimizations for me. Web fonts, obviously, is going to be um, part of it too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's like a, one thing I would probably tell you uh, not to use is the JavaScript template literals. That will most likely be <laughs> be going away if I have any say in the matter. Um, just because I I don't want to maintain it. I don't think anyone needs it. Um, so. Yeah. I assume I assume you're using Liquid for historical purposes, coming from Jekyll, like in in your blog, for example. Yep. Uh, if you were starting a new project from scratch, is there one that you would you would go with? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, most people, when they're doing new projects, use NetJex. That's probably the most popular one. Um, it just has a lot of power built into it. Um, the JavaScript one obviously is the fastest, but it has the least sort of power out of the box. Um, because you need to sort of add other, I mean, there's no, there's no mechanism to do like internal template includes widgets around JavaScript. You have to sort of manage that yourself. So it's kind of more of a lot less. Um, so I would say NetJex is probably one of the most popular ones, um, for sure. Are there any other questions? When you run it, like the output, does it check the, if anything has changed and, or does it just Rewrite everything. It rewrites everything right now, uh, and that has actually been good enough for most projects. So I do have a project that I use it on that has thirty thousand templates, input templates, um, and that has prompted me to start working on more incremental builds. Um, that pro that project basically I iterate over my entire Twitter uh, data set. So every tweet that I ever posted, and I have a like a archive on my site of all my tweets. You can actually go to that if you want to check mm -hmm. it out real quick. But um, when I run that, it outputs 30,000 files every time. Um, which, so there's a link to Twitter archive up there on the top. Um, so yeah, it's 29,000 uh, output files that runs from a single pagination template, input template. Um, so yeah. Is that I mean, like a Twitter export data of your data and then Right. So originally it started as a Twitter export because you can go to your settings and get like a full dump of your data. But I, I have some additional stuff I built onto that because I don't want to export my data every time. So it, it will actually like fetch all my new tweets automatically. Um, so this this by itself, like uh, I can get this to run in like twenty seconds. Like on my on my local computer, which is really pretty good for like uh, for thirty thousand file writes. Um, 
Now, when, when I started to add more and more features to this, it got slower, obviously. Um, but when it was just doing the, like, the core 11 work, um, it took about 20, 25 seconds to, to run the build, which was pretty good. And then I added like image caching to cache all my images locally and all that stuff, and then the build started to get slower. Um, but really, the R sync, the R sync to deploy this thing is just nasty. It's bad. Anyway, um, is that it for your question? Yeah. All right. Any other questions? So you said the most common use uh, that you've seen is people making personal websites, blogs, stuff like that. What if, what's the uh, the least common or the weirdest? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good example, or a really good question. There's somebody made an 11 site that would uh, write music. And I don't, well, I don't know about, can I go to your Twitter? Is that like, okay? I'm gonna post, I'm gonna tweet pooping. Um, um, 11 to music, maybe? No? Uh, Gosh, what was that? Maybe it's on the 11D website. Uh, shoot, I wonder what the search word term was. But he was actually outputting like sheet music, like data-driven sheet music with 11D. And I was like, what the heck is this? This is crazy. Um, I'll find that and I'll tweet it out later. But um, what is CERN used for? CERN used it for. I can show you. Uh, so they actually rec. Uh oh. Maybe I can't show you. That's weird. You went to uh, no, it seem to be fine. Twitter was fine. Let's test it on my phone. Yeah, it works on my phone. Try it in Chrome. Let's blame uh, Safari. Oh, you want to tether real quick? Um, anyway, CERN recreated uh, like the early, the, like the very first web browser. Um, and they didn't use Eleni to create like a web music. So you could go to the CERN website and type in a, your, your uh, any URL into it and it would show you how the first web browser rendered the site. Uh, oh, there it goes. Okay, cool. Um, so this site is built using 11D. The uh, actual web browser was built using something else, but yeah. Um, any other questions? All right. If you guys end up making anything with 11D, definitely let me know. I'd be trying to look through. All right, cool. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.